Welcome back, folks. We are starting our last unit in AP Biology, Unit 8 on Ecology. Uh, today's video is, we'll call it Part 1, um, Response to the Environment, or for lack of a better term, Behavior. And it goes along with AP uh, Biology topics. It's topic 8.1. Um, and you can find it in our book in Chapter 51. So let's start. So, response to environment or behavior in animals. A behavior is simply an action carried out by muscles in animals, okay, under control of the nervous system. Now, it can be more complex stuff like in us or very simple stuff as in other organisms. Um, in some organisms, it may be chemical signals and other mechanisms to behave or respond in a particular way to the environment. Uh, think about plants and phototropism where they can turn to face the sun over the course of the day. That's not a nervous system response, a little bit different. Um, think about these questions, guys. Why do organisms need to respond to changes in the environment? Yeah, we've got to respond to change in the environment so we can stay alive. We need to maintain that homeostasis. We need to um, get enough water. We need to stay warm or cool off. We need to run from predators. Uh, we need to find food. We need to find the right food. Um, and knowing what foods to do. So, you know, move towards light or away from light so we can get what we need. Um, so we need to respond to the environment so that we can stay alive. That following question then, are behavioral responses to the environment subject to natural selection? Yeah, they can be. Um, if it's a behavior that is more or less likely to happen because of genetics, um, then it is subject to natural selection. If it's something that's not in any way subject to genetics, then it wouldn't be. But if it's subjected to genetics, it's something that can be passed down, or some aspect of that behavior uh, can be passed down to the children, um, whether that is the behavior itself or the ability to teach and learn that behavior, it can be subject to natural selection. Um, and so what we're looking at here in this first part is the study of behavioral ecology, or the study of the ecological and evolutionary basis for animal behavior. Now, if we're looking at that, there's two areas we can look at. We can look at the proximate cause and the ultimate cause for these behaviors. The proximate cause is simply the how a behavior occurs or is modified. In other words, you have the stimulus and it causes that behavior. Um, simplest form would be like a reflex, right? You tap on your patellar tendon on your leg like you do at the doctor's office and your leg kicks out. Stimulus is the tap, the leg bouncing out is a response. That's a very simple version of it. Stimulus response. Now, the underlying question then becomes, why do you have that response? Why did we evolve that response? That's a response common across pretty much all humans. So it's in our genes. And that would be the ultimate causation. Why the behavior occurs in the context of natural selection. So why do you think natural selection favored that pattern? Well, uh, that pattern is if you're walking along, like on a, you know, in a forest or along a sidewalk or whatever, and you're walking and this foot gets caught on a, on a rock or a root or something, and, you, and it does a quick pull back on your patella tendon right here, and it pulls it back, well, all of a sudden, you start to fall down, right? So a way to help protect yourself from falling flat on your face and causing damage and messing up your homeostasis is to get this leg to kick out really quick to catch your fall. So that behavior evolved to in response to that stimulus so that we didn't fall on our faces. Helped us stay upright. And you can, you can equate that with all sorts of other very simple behaviors. And we can even equate it to a lesser extent with more complex behaviors um, that might have a bit more going on than just that one stimulus response. Um, now, the one I just described is a fixed action pattern. It's a sequence of unlearned acts directly linked to a simple stimulus. That's a behavioral reflex, okay? <clears throat> Those fixed action patterns are unchangeable generally, and once initiated, initiated usually carried to completion. Um, you can, depending on the particular reflex, alter it a little bit a little after you start it. You could choose not to kick your leg all the way out, but it'd be hard to stop. Um, and that action pattern is usually triggered by an external cue known as a sign stimulus. So in the case of that leg one, it would be, you know, the, the stretch in your quadriceps muscles. Um, 
in turn of the uh, fight, flight, or fight response. It could be a really loud noise behind you. It could cause you to jump in your seat and turn and look towards the animal and get your heart rate going and release adrenaline and stuff like that. Auditory cue could be a visual cue, too. You see a spider, you scream, you know, whatever. Um, an example of this, uh, and I did do some stickleback research when I was working in the evolutionary lab. Uh, male sticklebacks with red underbellies um, they will respond aggressively when they see another male stickleback who also has a red belly. Um, and the thing is, they will respond aggressively to anything <laughs> that has red. Like a researcher noticed that when a red truck drove by his window, the male sticklebacks would respond aggressively. Um, so it doesn't matter what shape it is. They see red, they get mad. That would be a stimulus and a response. Uh, migration is an example of this. Uh, environmental cues can trigger movement in a particular direction, and migration is simply a regular long distance change in location. Those wildebeest in that picture do it. We see around here geese and ducks and monarchs doing it all the time. Um, so, and they can orient themselves using different things. Uh, some of it is uh, the position of the sun. They can know they're going the right direction based on where the sun is. Now with that, you do have to be aware of what time of day it is because you're going to orient yourself different in relation to the sun in the morning than in the evening, because in the morning it's, you know, one place, in the evening it's another place. So you got to have a circadian clock, a rhythm in your brain to see that. Um, nocturnal animals can do it with the stars. Um, we know that some animals are able to do it with, by detecting their magnetic field. We're still not quite sure how they do that, but we have been able to disrupt their ability to detect a magnetic field by putting magnets near them. And then they get goofed up on what direction they're going. So... Lots of things going on with migration that we're still learning about, but it's really cool, and that is a behavioral pattern in response to a stimulus. Now, what stimulates it uh, could be all sorts of things, okay? Um, could be circadian rhythm, um, daily activities, um, annual rhythms, like when it gets hotter or colder or changes in the amount of sunlight. Um, like with geese, it's kind of the day gets shorter and the weather gets colder, and that's going to say, hey, I should fly somewhere warmer, okay, um, at this point. So, and that's called the circannual rhythm, so of knowing what time of year it is, basically. Um, like the daily darkness I talked about, lunar cycles can do it too. Um, some organisms uh, sync their mating times with uh, when it's a full moon. Um, why would that kind of response to the environment be beneficial to survival, guys? What do you think? There are lots of potential reasons, right? Um, it could be like with mating seasons, you see that a lot, like deer they will go into rut in the mid late fall and because of their gestation period that allows them to give birth um, in the spring and that way they've got they give birth at a good time for their babies to be able to access food and for mothers to have good nutrition to nurse them and and make it so it's all about having babies at the right time um, a lot of them are related to that especially when it comes to reproductive cycles um, migration it's to get to the better food sources at the right time of the year and all those kind of things. Um, animal signals and communication. Um, a signal in behavioral ecology is a behavior that causes a change in another animal's behavior. Okay, so that red belly, that was a signal. The well, sticklebacks got mad. So that was a signal that caused a change. And communication is the transmission and reception of those signals. Um, so you can think like mating dances and things like that. So attracting a mate. Um, you do one thing and the mates say, ooh, let's have kids. Okay. That would, the signaling is the mating dance or whatever it is you're doing to attract the mate. And the communication is that the other one responds to that signal. So that is a form of communication. Not as much so as like we're used to as humans with writing and, and speech, but it's still communication. Okay. What are some different forms of it? I already mentioned a couple. You can have visual Okay, mating dances, seeing the red, uh, you know, red belly on the stickleback, chemical stuff like pheromones, tactile, which is touch, auditory, which is sound, um, taste, um, all those can be ways that animals can communicate. Um, one that's been studied a lot is fruit flies, and they get a, a stimulus response chain going. And all the stimulus response chain is this stimulus causes this response. Whatever that response is, could likely trigger the next, is a, becomes the stimulus for the next response, 
which can become the stimulus for the next response. So you can have one behavior leading to the next, leading to the next, leading to the next. So it's simply a cascade. It's kind of like we've seen cascades of that kind of that nature all throughout this course, right? From signaling cascades to all sorts of things at the cellular level, and we can even have it at the behavior level. Okay. So like with the fruit flies, first thing they do, ooh, the male sees the female, he looks towards her. All right. Then he smells her. See, okay. I'm trying to smell the female's chemicals to see, make sure she's the right thing to mate with. Um, then he goes up and touches her and says, hey, I'm here. Maybe you want to do something. Okay. Um, and then he produces an auditory signal. He wiggles one of his wings to make a mating song. And if he does that, then the female can recognize him as being the same species, and then she might be able to mate. And you need all those steps to go from first seeing the mate until actually getting to the mating process. So that's a stimulus chain okay, or a sign chain. All right. Um, we can see other examples of this. I'm not going to get into the details, but you guys heard about honeybee dances, being able to communicate where the flowers are, how far away they are, what direction they are, that kind of thing. Pheromones you've probably heard about before, those are chemical substances uh, that communicate over distances. So uh, kind of like smell. So you got molecules that are released that the other organisms can detect. Sometimes it smells, sometimes it's taste. Those two senses are pretty tightly linked in some organisms. Um, this one's over here showing like a fish in distress will release some pheromones that cause the other fish to get agitated and school together and drop down low in the lake or the tank in this case. Um, and that way predators can't get to them from below. So that's how they let each other know, hey, I was attacked. You should be watchful. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of other things with pheromones here, but you guys have heard about pheromones before. Whoop. Um, pheromones can be effective at very low concentrations. Uh, you don't need much of it. Um, now, the animal's lifestyle can affect which type of signaling um, and communication is more likely to happen. Nocturnal animals, which happens to be most terrestrial mammals, bats, skunks, raccoons, those kind of things, depend on olfactory and auditory communication. Whereas diurnal animals, ones that mostly live during the, or not live, but carry out most of their functions during the daylight hours, like humans and most birds, we tend to be visual and auditory communicators. So the question for you is, why do you think there's a difference between nocturnal and diurnal animals in signaling preferences? And does that have anything to do with natural selection? Well, if you're nocturnal, visual signals, you're not going to be able to detect them from very far away. Um, and, and they're not going to be very useful because um, it's hard to see at night. But pheromones... Okay, olfactory, um, and then auditory calls, those are just as effective at night as they are during the day. So those are great. You can use them night or day, and if you're mostly nocturnal, you might as well use those. If you're mostly diurnal, like with birds, you got the bright feathers and the fancy mating dances, um, so that they can use visual stuff. We use visual stuff, a lot of facial recognition things in our brains to respond to that as part of our communication. It's not just the auditory speech, it's also facial cues and body gestures, which I do a lot of. Um, similar kind of thing, because those visual things make sense during the day. -to -day. All right. Uh, if we're not doing this in class, guys, you should be doing concept check 51.1 on page 1138, numbers 1 and 2. Um, when you're done with that, um, I'll check back in with you, and we'll get started on the next bit of notes. Welcome back, folks. Hope those things went well for you. Can move on to the next part of the notes here. And we're going to look at the difference between innate and learned behavior. Um, we've mostly been talking about innate so far, that stimulus response. We hear a loud noise, we jump. Um, you stretch that calf, that thigh muscle, you kick your leg out, those kind of things. That is called innate behavior. It's de developmentally fixed and is not very among individuals. So you can see that same reaction across the human population, right? Um, same thing for a lot of the mating behaviors. We're talking about the, the songs, the dances, the pheromones, those kind of things. What can be even more interesting, though, is learned behavior. Learned behavior is changeable and can vary among individuals and among populations. Um, 
think of this like culture. Um, certainly see that in humans, but you can see in other animals as well, something that we can consider culture. Um, changes to some of that behavior that distinguish one population from another, which can lead to behavioral isolation and evolution, all sorts of stuff. All right, how does experience match up with behavior? You think you could design an experiment to determine how much of behavior is innate or uh, based in the genes and unchangeable and how much is learned, something you can get later in life. Well, the way some scientists have done this is they've done what we call cross-fostering studies. And you don't have to remember cross-fostering studies, uh, but we can take um, one animal and cross and, and have um, a different species, maybe a close related species, but a different species uh, care for it and raise it. And we see if that being raised in a different way changes the behavior of those children. And we do see that in some cases. Okay, so we can determine from that, you know, how much of their behavior is based on genetics or nature and how much is based on being learned, uh, which would be nurture. Okay. Um, oh, that's what I just said that there. Um, really interesting thing, guys, and I'll show you a little video rather than getting too deep into this, but the Minnesota twin studies um, that were done a number of years ago, and they still do things like this now, take a look at sets of twins who got raised separately. For some reason, they got split up at birth and raised in different families. And from that, they can figure out, okay, how much of what they do and how they live their lives might be innate to their genes and how much is learned through how they were raised. They're not perfect because they're not going to like raise the kids like totally different their whole lives. They just happen to use when they get raised by different foster families. But these foster families are generally all in the United States. They belong to the same basic culture and things like that. So it's not a perfect experiment, but it does have some pretty interesting stuff. I've got a little bit of a video clip I will show you um, rather than going too deep into it because it's just really fascinating. And we'll meet together on the other side and move on. Until he was 32, Mark Newman had no reason to suspect that his life story would be of any interest to science. He was adopted and raised in a middle-class family in New Jersey. As a child, he idolized John Wayne and loved the great outdoors. Perhaps the lure of adventure inspired him to become a fireman. <laughs> Just 60 miles away, another fireman makes his rounds. Jerry Levy also loves firefighting. But he and Mark Newman have something else in common. Reunited after 32 years, they now know they are identical twins. My parents had told me I was adopted. So, you know, they weren't my natural parents, so maybe there was some more family out there, but I really didn't think that much about it. Fine. That's what happened. I wasn't concerned about finding my real parents or if I had any, you know, natural relatives, brothers or sisters. It didn't bother me. But in the back of my mind, it was, you know, it always felt like it was something missing out of my life. When I met my brother, uh, that empty feeling I had had, it was gone immediately. You know, a little piece in the back of my mind said that there's something missing in my life. It was filled. The fact that, he, that we were both firemen it is a little spooky. We do have a saying, though, that, you know, Firemen aren't made. A fireman is born. So it's only natural. We're twins. We're identical twins. We're both firemen. We were born to be firemen. Jerry and Mark are identical twins because they inherited identical genes. Their story challenges long-held notions about heredity. At the University of Minnesota, twins are helping scientists understand just how genes make us who we are. Hi, Judy and Jill. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good. Uh, welcome to the lab. Thank you. Now, the first thing we want to do uh, is to get some... Judy Greer and Jill Freeman will undergo six days of testing that will include an extensive physical examination and a complete personality survey. Get a measure of your weight. Uh, keep going. <laughs> a lightweight. Yeah, that looks about right. It's not surprising that on nearly every kind of physical test, their scores match. 
Starting to work up a sweat? Yeah. <laughs> what is intriguing is their psychological closeness. Normally, this would be attributed to a common family life. But even twins separated at birth often share the same mannerisms and style of dress, the same dreams and phobias. These uncanny similarities pique the interest of psychologist Thomas Bouchard. Well, if somebody had come to me uh, 10, 12 years ago, before I initiated this study and started examining these twins, and told me the results we have now, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, my expectations were that uh, there, there are more hills and valleys uh, than there are flatlands. And by that I mean that I thought a good number of traits were largely environmental in origin, shaped by the family and the idiosyncratic environments that we experience, and that other traits are largely biological or genetic in influence. But our findings suggest that uh, there's a kind of pervasive genetic influence that uh, manifests itself in every kind of character we measure. No, actually, one time I remember we were playing charades and um, uh, they put us on the same team and uh, I stood up and I read my, my, my little clue and I yelled out, Rocky and Bullwinkle, and she hadn't done one thing. <laughs> yeah, one thing, and that was it. <laughs> she just thought about it really hard. Yeah, it was really spooky. The psychological profiles of twins are so close they have forced scientists to accept the influence of genes on personality. Traits like leadership and shyness are largely inherited. Creativity, aggressiveness, and orderliness seem to be shaped by genes as much as by environment. And to some degree, genes produce extroverts and conformists. We know virtually nothing about how you get from a gene to behavior. Uh, our study says genes must be important, and therefore we should look at biological mechanisms. Uh, but boy, we really know very, very little about those mechanisms. Twins offer us rare insight into the influence of genes on human behavior. All right. So I hope you found that interesting. I do. I know the video is a little bit old, but um, it's still just fascinating. Um, so what is learning? Learning is the modification of a behavior based on a specific experiments. experience. Okay. Um, so rather than doing it one way, you did it one way and it didn't work. So next time you do it a little bit differently or you did it one way and it worked. So the next time you do it the same way, um, in order to do that, you need to be able to remember things. So organisms that can learn behavior have to have some level of memory. Okay. Um, research into learning seeks to understand the contributions of both the nature or the innate behavior and the nurture or the learned behavior in shaping learning, because both those go together. Um, and any organism that can do innate learning or nurtured learning, um, both of those are going to play a role. Okay, There's going to be a range of behavioral possibilities based on your neurological structure and your senses and where you live and your genes, um, but that can be modified based on your experiences. Okay. Um, an example uh, that is sometimes looked at is imprinting. Um, you don't have to memorize imprinting, but it's just fascinating. You've probably heard about it. That um, in some, so imprinting is the establishment of a long lasting behavioral response to a particular individual or object. Um, we see this a lot in uh, waterfowl, like geese, for instance, right? Within the first couple of days, what we call the sensitive period of a goose's, of gosling's young life, they will imprint on their parent, hopefully. Um, what we found is it's not necessarily that they recognize that that is their parent. Um, it's that they imprint on this thing that's walking away from them because they have this behavior over here to follow the thing that's walking away. So if you don't have them with their mother, you know, those first couple of days, and instead you have this person doing that behavior, the goslings will imprint on that person, follow them everywhere, and they won't even recognize their own mother, and the mother won't recognize the kids if they're not together during that sensitive period. So that's a, a form of behavioral modification based on environment. Okay. Um, you can also talk about associative learning, where animals associate one feature of the environment with another. So here, you know, blue jay eating a monarch butterfly, um, it eventually does that once or twice. Okay. 
they don't taste good. They're really bitter because they're slightly poisonous. And so they're trying to get rid of it over here. Um, they won't do it again. They'll associate that color pattern of the monarch with that bad taste, so they don't do it. And that's why you see uh, mimicry um, evolutionarily in organisms where you see a lot of butterflies that look like monarchs, but they aren't monarchs. And they're not poisonous like monarchs. They don't taste like monarchs. Um, but they have evolved to look like them. The benefit being birds are less likely to eat them because they don't want to eat a uh, monarch and they can't tell the difference. Um, now, with associative learning, we can have a couple different types that have been studied. You guys probably learned about this in your psych class. Classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. So if you've had psych, you probably know this already. Uh, but classical conditioning is a type of associative learning in which an arbitrary stimulus is associated with a reward or a punishment. So it's like classic Pavlov's dog, right? You ring a bell, and if you ring a bell, and a little bit later, food always comes for the dog, that bell ringing, they will start associating that um, with um, food coming, and they'll start to salivate just when they hear the bell, even if no food is coming. So that's associative learning, uh, but it's associated with an arbitrary stimulus, something that's not necessarily related to it at all, okay? Operant conditioning, on the other hand, is a type of associated learning which an animal learns to associate one of its behaviors with a reward or punishment. So if I press that lever, I will get food. If I press that lever, I will get a shock. All right. Um, it's kind of like uh, if you watch Ghostbusters and one of the opening scenes where Bankman is um, testing these two students, see it, you know, and giving them shocks if they get it wrong and not shocks if they get it right kind of thing. It's way off the mark, but it's kind of based on that. Um, how are those two different? Yeah, classical is we just have some arbitrary association. It doesn't have to have to do anything to do with the the thing that's happening. Um, and that's not as evolutionarily concrete. Um, but animals that have really good memories and have are better able to think are more able to do classical conditioning. Okay. Um, if you don't have a good memory, you, you probably can't do that. Operant conditioning, on the other hand, definitely has a, a really strong evolutionary connection. Um, you know, uh, eat the butterfly, throw up. Okay. Food smells bad. I don't eat it. <laughs> okay. Uh, food tastes bad. I don't eat it. Okay. Um, so you see those kind of things. It definitely help you to avoid things you don't want to do. And do things you do want to do, like things that taste sweet, we like, okay, because it gives us high calories and things like that. That's more innate, though. Um, anyway, um, at this point, guys, you should do concept check on 51.2, page 1143, numbers 1 and 3. And I'll check you back here, and we'll go on to the next section. All right, folks, welcome back to our next chunk on behavior. Um and so selection for individual survival and reproduction success can explain many behaviors because what's natural selection if it's not survival and getting your genes to the next generation? So it would make sense that behaviors that affect your survival and behaviors that affect your ability to get your genes to the next generation would be fairly heavily selected for uh, by natural selection. So an example is natural selection refines behaviors that enhance the efficiency of feeding. Um, and so foraging is that food obtaining behavior, which includes recognizing the right foods, looking for the right foods, capturing the foods, eating the foods, all those things. So you got to be able to see the foods or smell the foods. You got to be able to reason where it's going to be. Uh, you got to be able to run fast enough to capture the food. You have the claws to grab it, the teeth to kill it if you're a predator. Um, the neck to reach the leaves high on the trees for giraffes, all those kind of things. Um, and going where those things are um, is part of this. Okay. So example uh, we can look at is foraging behavior in fruit flies. You don't know this example, but just to highlight it a little bit, um, there can be two different, um, there's an allele that affects how far the larva will travel to get food. Okay, so some of them have alleles that will only travel a little bit to get food. Others will tend to travel a lot further to get food. Okay, what we've seen with them is if you 
in uh, low density situations where you don't have too many larvae around, um, we tend to favor, uh, natural selection tends to favor those that only go a little ways to get their food. Whereas if we put them in a high density situation, natural selection tends to favor those who travel a long way, are more likely to travel a long way for their food. Why do you think that's the case? Yeah, in low density, you're not competing intraspecifically with other larvae too much. There's plenty of food to go around. You don't have to go far to get it. So why would you waste all that energy going a long way to find your food when you can just sit here and eat? Whereas in a high density population, there's not enough food in the immediate area. So if you want to get enough food, you better be willing to travel. So yeah, it costs you a little bit of the energy you get from a food to get that far, but it's better than not getting enough food at all. Um, and that kind of comes to, you know, the balancing of risk and reward. It's a good way to think about this. For most behaviors, there's there's a compromise, right? Um, there's a risk to doing that behavior, but there might be some reward. So the cost of obtaining food include the energy expenditure to get it, but the risk of being eaten while foraging or the risk of getting hurt while foraging or, not, or losing too much energy while foraging. And so risk of predation can greatly affect foraging behavior. Uh, we can see that in uh, mule deer populations. Um, the nutrient density is higher in the forest and on the edge of the forest and lower out in the open grasslands. However, the risk of predation is higher on the edge of the forest and a little bit in from like mountain lions and stuff. So what we tend to see is mule deer tend to feed out in the open grasslands. Um, they still able to get nutrition, but they have less risk of... Um, being predated upon, um, and that risk reward tends to be a little bit tilted towards feeding in the open, even though it's not as calorie dense, you're more likely to survive that way than if you eat on the edge of the forest. Okay. Uh, so natural selection for, should favor foraging behavior that minimizes costs and maximizes benefits. Can you apply this reasoning to other behaviors? Think if you write them down, um, and then we'll discuss that next time I see you in person. Um, I think this one's a good one to have an open class discussion. But try to think of some other behaviors where this risk reward uh, type thinking might play a role in how things evolve. All right. So that was, you know, survival. Now let's talk about mating systems and parental care, reproductive success. Um, so the needs of the young are an important factor. I don't have to know the specific things here, but evolution can play a role in these mating systems parental care. And the needs of the young are an important factor constraining the evolution of mating systems. So, for instance, females know their kids have their genes. No question. If it comes out of me, that kid's got my genes, right? Males have a lot less certainty on whether the kids have their genes, particularly in certain types of mating systems. And that makes a difference. How much energy are you going to put into protecting and caring for young if you're not sure they're actually your young from an evolutionary standpoint, right? Obviously you care for the young and all that, but evolutionary, these behaviors evolve to make sure that your genes get to the next generation. So things that are, are selected for that increase the chances of those genes that you did getting to the next generation. Okay. So consider a bird species where the chicks needs a continuous supply of food. A male will maximize his reproductive success by doing what? Yeah, staying with his mate and helping to care for the chick's monogamy. If those kids need a lot of care, if the male leaves and it's all on the female, it's going to be harder for those chicks to survive, so you're more likely to get monogamy in those situations. And just an FYI, in those situations where you have strong monogamy between the, the two parents, um, you get less of that sexual dimorphism where one bird's camouflaged and the other one's really bright, right? Like you see with ducks or peacocks. Um, because both parents need to sit on the nest for a while. Both parents got to sit still and hopefully not be seen and eat. On the other hand, take a bird species where the chicks are soon able to feed and care for themselves. So you hatch, mother doesn't have to stay with them very long, and then the kids are off on their own. The male can maximize his reproductive success by doing what? Seeking additional mates, right? Um, there's no real benefit to him sticking around and helping. The kids have, is going to have just about as much success surviving or not. And he's not super sure that those kids are his because he may have mated with that hen 
you know, a couple months ago, but other somebody else might have made it with him in that time in between. So he's less sure about that, and there's less benefit for him sticking around. And that's why I say, like in pheasants, the females are really well camouflaged, but the males are relatively gaudy because they're more interested in attracting mates and finding more mates, whereas the females are the ones that have to stay hidden. All right. Paternal certainty is relatively low in species with internal fertilization because mating and birth are separated over time. That's what I talked about with the, the male mating with the hen a couple months before. There's a lot less certainty that those kids are actually his because she could have mated with somebody else. Um, but in species where, that have internal fertilization, um, you can see the male sticking around um, like males with uh, a pride of lions, right? Because they can chase off other rivals. And so that increases their certainty that those kids are theirs. And then they also have multiple females as well. Um, we also want to say here. Oh, external fertilization. If fertilization is external, like in a lot of amphibians and fish, um, a lot of times there's no parental care, whatever. They just lay thousands of eggs and they hope a few survive. But in those instances where there is some parental care, they'll tend to lay fewer eggs um, because the way they're increasing the chance of genes surviving to the next generation is they take care of those eggs. And it's like 10% of the population of those types of organisms. But in those cases, uh, you see a much higher rate of the male and female both, or maybe even the male taking care of the, the kids more than the female. You see the males carrying the fish in their in their jaws, for instance, not the fish. The males carrying the eggs in their jaws until they're ready to hatch to protect them. Like, oh, right there's a good picture of it. So if you have any questions, guys, stop in and see me, um, and I'll meet you for the next section of the video. But in the meantime, do the scientific skills exercise on page 1144. Um, it looks like this, about crows and foraging behavior. See you in a little bit. Bye. All right, folks, on to the next section. We're going to look at the ultimate cause for some of these uh, types of uh, variations. Um, so genetics and a concept we're going to call inclusive fitness. Um, so animal behavior is governed by complex interactions between the genetics and the environmental factors. We talked about it before. Nature versus nurture. Okay, And part of that, we can talk about selfless behavior as well. Um, and selfless behavior um, can be explained by inclusive fitness because often we think selfless um, doesn't benefit you getting your genes into the next generation. You sacrificing yourself to save somebody else, how does that help your genes make it to the next generation, right? It doesn't seem like that would be evolutionarily beneficial, at least on its surface. Um, but let's just back up just a hair and talk about how um, sometimes a single gene can affect behavior. Um, so... A master regulatory gene can control many behaviors. So you can have a, a simple variation in one gene that could affect a complex set of behaviors, like uh, mating and rearing uh, habits in, in organisms, like uh, prairie voles, two different types of prairie voles, right? One of them um, sticks around and takes care of the young and, and pair bonds with, the, with his mate. The other one could care less and goes away. Scientists figured out that this was caused by a difference in the number of what we call uh, vasopressin receptors in the nervous system. And the ones that stayed and took care of the young and pair bonded had a lot of those vasopressor receptors. And the ones who didn't, and the other close related species, didn't have nearly as many of those. Um, and then they tested it by actually putting, altering the gene in the ones who didn't have as many of the vasoreceptors and put that gene in there. Uh, so it had lots of vasoreceptors, or vasopressin receptors, I should say. Um, and then that one who, before, that species didn't pair bond much and take care of the kids much, now did. So that single change in that receptor amount, okay, that product of a gene, so it wasn't the actual protein itself, but the receptors that connected to the protein made a difference there. Whereas in fruit flies, there's a master regulatory gene that controls many of the behaviors of the male fruit fly that we talked about before, the whole orient and smell and touch and buzz your wing stuff, right? Um, and what they found is if they knocked that out in the male, the male wouldn't do those behaviors and thus wouldn't mate. Um, and they could transfer that, 
or turn on that allele or turn on that gene in the females. And if they did, the females would try to mate with other females. They would do the male behavior so that one master gene controlled everything else. So there's definitely can be a lot of genetic basis of behaviors and small changes in s certain genes or even just one gene can make a big difference in behavior. So you can get quite a bit of variation in behavior coming from genetic variation. One of the keys we need for evolution, right? Okay, so genetic variation, the evolution of behavior. So when behavioral variation within a species corresponds to environmental variation, it may be evidence of past evolution. So uh, think of two populations with different predators. Um, so let's think of some, let's just say two rabbit populations, okay, on either side of a, a mountain range. They're the same species of rabbits, okay, but they've been geographically or allopatrically isolated for a while. Um, and in the, on one side of the mountains, their main predator is coyotes, okay? Um, not a lot of birds, okay? But on the other side of the mountains, not very many coyotes, but a lot of hawks and owls and things that would try to come down and eat them, okay? So we've got different predator preference, you know, there. So those ones that um, are living where there's lots of birds, their behavior is probably going to select for those who are always looking up and very conscious of shadows and things like that. Whereas the ones on the side of the mountain where there's not as many birds, but a lot more ground predators, um, probably going to be listening more at the ground level, looking around and going in areas where it's hard for those kind of predators to get to them. So we'll see some differences in behavior there. So if we see differences in behavior based on where the population is um, and the genetics of those two populations, that's evidence that there's um, probably some past evolution going on here or you're on the path to evolution. Uh, one example is um, we got a, a snake there eating a banana slug, which lives on the coast in the Pacific Northwest, right? Um, and different populations, these garter snakes feed on different things. The ones in the Pacific North and along the coast eat a lot of banana slugs. The ones further inland don't because there's not many banana slugs there, okay? Um, and the difference in the diet we have determined at, at this point, are genetic. At some point, they think in the evolutionary past, a group of garter snakes made it to the coast. Um, some of them were able to detect the um, and respond to the odor molecules produced by the banana slugs and thought they'd be good to eat. And those few that were able to do that, that had that variation, uh, were much more likely to survive and reproduce because they had better nutrition because the banana slugs were abundant and easy to catch. Um, and so that population eventually became just about all the snakes could recognize that odor and track them down and would want to eat those banana slugs and find them, find that they were food. Whereas the ones further inland, they'd hardly ever touch banana slugs. They didn't recognize that it was food uh, because of that. So on to altruism and cooperative behavior. Natural selection favors behavior that maximizes an individual survival and reproduction, right? What are the chances of your genes making to the next generation? You gotta live long enough and you gotta pass them on. Those behaviors are often selfish though, right? You want, you want to survive and you want to pass your genes on. You don't care about other folks. On occasion though, some animals behave in ways that reduce their individual fitness, but increase the fitness of others. That kind of behavior we're gonna call altruism. Okay. Some examples of it. Um, there's certain types of blendings ground squirrels. Um, if they're under threat from a predator, um, they will make an alarm call to warn others in their area, even though calling increases the chances that the caller is killed because it's easier for the predator to find them. So that's definitely altruistic. It doesn't help that individual calling a squirrel to call out loud, but it helps all the ones around it run and hide. We'll talk about why that might help why that might have been able to evolve. Another example is naked mole rats, uh, where they have a queen and a couple of kings, and then all of the other individuals are kind of like with her kids or cousins. Um, and some of those non-reproducing ones, because those ones that aren't the kings or the queen, they won't reproduce. Uh, they may sacrifice their lives protecting the reproductive queen or kings from predators. See the same kind of thing with bees, right? You got one queen and you got a king. Everybody else is a drone. Um, that aren't going to reproduce, um, and they often sacrifice their lives to save the hive. We'll talk about the evolutionary implications here in a second. So uh, the term 
the evolution of altruistic behavior can be explained by uh, a term called inclusive fitness. Um, so the guy who came up with this, I think his name was Hamilton, um, called inclusive fitness the total effect an individual has on proliferating its genes by producing offspring and helping close relatives produce offspring. The assumption is that close relatives should share a lot of the same genes as you, so it's beneficial to the genes in you if you survive and if your brother or sister or first cousin survive, right? And we call yeah, it was Hamilton. And that's called Hamilton's rule and kin selection. And he proposed a quantitative measure, a way to quantify that, um, to predict when natural selection would favor altruistic acts among related individuals. Okay, so a way to predict, should you do, altru is altruism going to help you? You know, the total genes move on to the next generation, or is it going to hurt that? Three key variables in an altruistic act. One, the benefit to the recipient, okay, the person being helped. How much benefit is there? C is the cost to the altruistic, so the cost to the one who's being altruistic, putting themselves at some risk to do whatever it is they're doing. And then the third thing is how related are the two? How many of the genes do they share in common, which we call the coefficient of relatedness, um, which is simply the fraction of genes that, on average, are shared. We'll call that little r. And natural selection favors altruism when the benefit to the individual times the relatedness, so how much, how many genes they share, is greater than the cost to the altruistic. So let's apply this. Okay. Hamilton's rule is illustrated um, with the example of a girl who risked her life to save her brother. Okay. Let's say your brother's drowning in the ocean or your brother is. Uh, fell over a cliff, okay? And you got to go get him and, and bring him back up, okay? But it's risky. You could fall and die too, right? So how do we figure this out? Well, keep that in mind and now read the following bit of information here and explain it in your own words to an elbow partner, okay? And make sure to discuss the evolutionary implications. So Pause this video, read through this stuff, discuss it with somebody else. If you're not with somebody else right now, then kind of jot down what you want to discuss, um, what you would say, and then come back and I'll discuss it with you. All right, pause it now. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you got some ideas here. So one of the first things we've got to figure out is in this case, we're going to assume the average individual has two children, right? In some species, it might be the average individual has 10 children or 20 children or one child. Um, that's going to depend on the particular species. Um, so the average individual has two char children as a result of the sister's action. So the brother, in this case, we're going to say for humans, it's an average of two. So if the brother is saved, the beneficiary here, the benefit is two. He gets two sets of his genes into the next generation. Now the sister, let's say trying to get over this cliff or get out into the surf to save her brother, has a 25 chance of dying. Okay, 25% chance of dying. Which means she's got a 75% chance of living and being also able to have two children. So her um, cost is 0.25 is a chance of death times the two kids, the two sets of genes. And so that equals 0.5. So the cost to her is 0.5. The benefit to the brother is 2. So there's definitely a bigger benefit to the brother than the sister because the brother's not risking his life to save himself where the sister is. Makes sense. The brother and sister share half their genes on average, right? About, so R is equal to 0.5. So if the sister saves the brother, R, 0.5 times B, the benefit to the beneficiary, 0.5 times two is one, and that is greater than the cost to the sister of 0.5. So on average, 
the number of genes from that family that, that are going to be able to make it to the next generation would be greater than the number of genes that are lost by doing that altruistic act. So this really only benefits if you're fairly closely related. If you're really distantly related, there's not as much benefit to this. Okay. And we call that kin selection. It is the natural selection that favors this kind of altruistic behavior by enhancing the reproductive success of relatives. So going back to those ground squirrels, okay? Um, so ground squirrels, the females tend to stay close to where they were born, um, and the males tend to go further away. So for the females, um, if one of them is endangered in a particular area, if they call out more than the rest, the rest are probably, that are around them and can hear that, are probably pretty closely related. So there's a high relatedness, so even if that one dies, a lot of the others are going to survive to pass on their genes. So the benefit to the total gene pool is greater than the cost to the individual. Okay. Um, naked mole rats, because they're all really closely related, and we got those non-reproductive individuals, they're not going to pass on their genes no matter what, right? But if they sacrifice themselves to protect the queen or the king, that's where their closest relative is, and that definitely increases the chance of their genes making to the next generation. So in Kotlin, you see the same thing with bees, right? You know, once they sting once, they lose their stinger, and then they're out of luck, and they die. Well, they wouldn't have reproduced anyway, so the, the cost to the gene pool is zero, okay? But the benefit is huge, because then the queen can have how many thousands of babies, right? So that's where we get kin selection coming in, okay? Um, so you have to be, it's got to be relatively close related, and um, it's more likely to happen if, the one incurring the cost is less likely to reproduce than the one who isn't. In humans, it's a little more on the on the uh, bubble there. So reciprocal altruism. So this is altruistic behavior toward unrelated individuals. Okay, so now we're talking about altruism, saving somebody you've got no clue of. Okay, they're they're not a, a cousin or anything. There's no not any necessarily genes in common but you still risk your life to save them. That can be adaptive if the aided individual returns the favor in the future, right? I risk my life for you, you risk your life for me. Okay. That type of altruism we call reciprocal altruism because I'll do it for you, you do it for me kind of thing. That is really only limited to species with stable social groups. Okay, So ones where um, the, in, the two individuals are more likely to meet repeatedly, um, so there's a greater likelihood that they'll be able to reciprocate that, um, that thing. Like, um, if you're living in a small community, like a hunter-gatherer community, you've got some extra food and somebody else over there is starving. Well, I killed a, you know, an antelope this morning. I'm going to share some with, with my buddy over there. And he lives. Well, in that nice, tight-knit social group, there's going to be some time when you haven't caught any food, and they have, and they will give you some back. So even though you're costing yourself some nutrients, overall, in the grand scheme of things, if you have a strong society, a strong culture, um, helping each other out can make a pretty big difference to the overall survival of everybody's genes, right? Um, so we tend to see that. That's what's used to explain altruism between unrelated individual humans. Um, there's not many organisms that do that. Humans chimpanzees, um, and other t ones with tight-knit groups, but that's relatively unusual. So we're pretty cool that way. All right, guys, that'll do it for the part one notes. At this point, do the concept check, uh, 51.4. It's on page 1154, numbers two and three. When you finish that, go into AP Bio and do the topic questions for this section. They are... Topic questions 8.1. See you next time, guys. Have a good one.